Check the evidence. There is no supernatural devil. This is the, the premise of the title that we have today. It's fairly clear. From this platform, on this very floor, we, we often have lectures. We have talks, discussions about Bible-based things. We detail the Bible's truth regarding the topics of things like the devil, Satan, demons, etc. in many different times. I personally have dealt with several related topics in the past, including let the Bible explain the terms demons and evil spirits, or the Bible devil unmasked, or is the devil what you think, which was rephrased to is what you think the devil. Another one is the serious question of how the devil works. These are topics which we have dealt with in the past. Other topics may be related to the truth about Lucifer, or the devil not a fallen angel or the devil and Satan defined. None of those are the topics for this evening. The topic for this evening is there is no supernatural devil. Now, first and foremost, Christadelphians are Bible-believing Christians, followers of Christ's words and deeds, and we refer to the Bible as our authority. And while we may use other resources and cross-reference various details with history, archaeology, literature, and even art many forms of artwork, the Bible is our source of authority and with respect to seeking out the truth of the world, the truth with respect to um, the ultimate purpose and direction of humanity and the world at large. For us, when society and politics diverge from um, biblical norms, we try to remain extremely grounded and firm in the, the Bible truth as we have them presented to us and as they are revealed. So we could start quite promptly by concluding with our opening hypothesis that there is no supernatural devil, and then we could, if no one can provide any evidence, we could always just have a scrumptious supper and move on largely uninformed. It would be a short talk, and, and unless we have the resources and time to actually go through all of the associated topics, we've just got a few questions which we'll try to ask and answer this evening. Firstly, is the devil in the Bible? Is the devil supernatural? What does supernatural mean? Sub-question, sub is the concept of supernatural in the Bible, i.e., is the concept at all biblical? Is the devil personal or other? So the first question, is the devil in the Bible? Well, it's quite easy to sort that one out, which is why we had as a reading from Matthew chapter 4 this evening. We, we read from Matthew chapter 4 and you could see it's related, relating to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And it mentions the tempter, the devil, comes and asks him some hard questions and puts him in some difficult positions for which he was tempted. And, and we can phrase it, tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Now, word searches of the Bible are very easy. And back in the day, we used, to, we used to publish lists. We liked lists. People liked printing things called books. Pages and pages of lists of words from the Bible detailing the occurrence of every, common, or every English word in the Bible and matching it up to their Hebrew or their Greek, their original language word. And these things were called uh, concordances. These are gone nowadays. Nowadays we've moved on. Nowadays we use computers, we use the internet, we use IT, and we, we are able to very quickly search for things. And these tools are readily available for all people everywhere to actually to access and to see what, what the status is regarding the Bible. Now a quick search of the Bible will show that the word devil occurs in the King James Bible 61 times in 57 verses. Um, in newer translations, they use different words for some occurrences. For instance, in the New King James Version, um, the word devil only occurs um, 35 times in 33 verses. Interesting. It's good to cross-match these things and see why the differences occur, which we're not going to go into tonight, but it's just interesting. So we know the devil is real. It's in the Bible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even the God's Word version of the Bible um, has it 41 times in 36 verses. So even the most literal or liberal translations of the Bible do have the word devil printed therein. Of course, we can create, is the devil supernatural? Um, as a title states the contrary. So we have to wonder why people would think 
it is, um, but it encourages us to check the evidence. Now, of course, we could ask what does supernatural mean in the Bible, and the problem with that is um, the idea and concept of supernatural doesn't really occur in the Bible. Apparently, this word, um, which is a combination word, was first used about the 15th century by authors, and it's used to refer to things, beings, events, or places which do not bear explanation by usual means. Things that are unexplainable using ration, logic, or prior experience or the senses. It was not is a term used to refer to things like ghosts, monsters, demons, hobgoblins, fairies, things which some may claim to exist in the paranormal or extra normal spheres, if that makes any sense. Now, the Bible does, in fact, refer to witches and wizards and people who peep and mutter, there are phrases, and those who seek out, as the Bible calls them, familiar spirits, having seances, attempting to, to raise the spirits of the dead, so to say. Now, in the Bible, um, the law of Moses, especially in the Old Testament, is very explicit about these things. It actually condemns such things as, um, and slates them down as um, pagans or pagan practices, seeking out the meaning of what is not and making a fiction out of religion. If we were to look in Leviticus in chapter 20, it basically says in verse 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or has a familiar spirit shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them. And that's all very, very sudden and very um, final in the, in the Old Testament. But it shows how God actually sees these practices. Many times in the Old Testament it talks about um, pagan worship and worshipping idols and worshipping other things apart from God, especially with reference to his people Israel. And it, it states that the, the other idols are not gods at all, but mere chunks of wood and stone and idols and glass, things that people have made with their hands to replace what would be a, a true and, and right worship of God. The children of Israel were instructed in Deuteronomy 18 that when they were to come into the land which the Lord God was going to give them, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. So pagan practices where you sacrifice your children, which is obviously abhorrent to all of us, um, or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritualist or one who calls up the dead. It says, For those who do th such things are an abomination to Yahweh. Because of these abominations, the Lord drives out the people before you. So it's basically saying that this false spiritualist idea, this false, false con con connection with the, the underworld, the supernatural space, if you like, was an abomination to God. And he sees it merely as a replacement of the true God of heaven and earth as the one to worship. It is merely an attempt to bewitch the masses and seduce them with fables and craft that does not come from God. We read in James 3 verse 15, talks about um, the things that aren't from God. It says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and it uses the word demonic or daimonial. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So the supernatural, though, what that is over and above the normal or the natural, we could call it the spiritual. In the Bible, we, we, we see things referred to as spirit or spiritual quite often. So we would rephrase our title, Is the Devil Spiritual? Which also raises a whole other set of quandaries and, and things to explore. Now, there are people who may argue about the paranormality of the devil. Um, they would attest beyond all reason that the devil is the most anti-God, anti-spiritual construct that exists. So therefore, calling the devil spiritual seems to be a violence to the term. You could see it's antithesis to the rational spiritual person if there ever was one. So the other question we may have to have in the back of our mind along the way is, is the devil personal at all? Is it a he, she, they, then an individual? Is it a real breathing, living thing, a hypernatural individual or something else? 
Now, does the Bible deal with the spiritual and on how many levels? Well, indeed it does. The Bible does deal with things which are not normal, things which are outside of our general experience. Um, there you go, anti-spiritual, spiritual. Here we go. So we, we, re, we read in the Bible that there are miraculous events which are said to be sent from God or be outworkings of God's miraculous spirit, his Holy Spirit even, his ability to do things beyond the normal um, you know, laws of thermodynamics, if you like. We read in um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, says the New King James Version. So the Bible presents us that scripture itself, the writings which were written, and if you go to First Peter, or 2 Peter 1, it says... Um, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in verse 21 at the bottom there. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men were moved by the Holy Spirit and spake from God. The AV has it a little bit differently, which we all have in, in, in a, a memory, those who have been through the Sunday school system, learn these things. Um, so we know there that the, the revelation of the Bible is not normal. It is supernatural, if you like. Re rephrase it as spiritual. So the Bible is the work of God, the word of God, written by many hands over thousands of years. It's been united and consolidated purposefully, and its job is to call out of the nations a people or a set of people who would be the men and women of God, as was said in First Timothy um, three verse, 2 Timothy 3 verse 17. The idea of the Bible is to allow us to be perfectly equipped to do the good work of God. So the Bible details the experiences of natural, normal men and women to record and tell events and dreams and things that were revealed to them by God through experiences in the other than normal plane. So we look and see that the Bible tells of the work of the creator, Yahweh, um, and he's, he sent a message to the original Hebrew, Hebrew people, those who were um, the descendants of Abraham, if you like, um, those who he had called out of the nations to be his special people in the time of the Old Testament. Um, we see that the God of the Bible comes from beyond and outside of all time and space. He's, he's said to be the invisible, the eternal, the uncreate, Immortal, the one who only dwells in light, who no man can see and who cannot bear to look upon iniquity. In Habakkuk 1 verse 3, it actually says that. It says um, the prophet is disputing with God in, in prose. He says, You are of pure eyes to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. So why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours someone more righteous than he? This is a dispute that the prophet's having with God himself, um, saying, God, you're, too, you're, so, you're so pure that you cannot look on wickedness. Um, and this is the God who we are, we are, we are um, said by, in the Bible to have sent the revelation to us. So the God of the universe is stated to be... Um, <clears throat> Read at his yeah sorry um, the God of the universe is stated in Romans chapter one to be readily apparent to all of those who spend time delving into the workings and the interactions of the natural world. It basically tells us in Romans one that if you actually spend time looking into the intricacies of nature, you'll actually see the hand of God there because things are so complex and so involved that it's. Next to impossible, we will say, that these things could have come around by any other means than that of an, an intelligent and active and extremely powerful creator. Of course, for those who deny that God exists, it's easy to believe that there is nothing beyond what our investigations can achieve. There's nothing supernatural or extraordinary, although spooky is still a thing. So those dreamers who will, off, will always attest that naturally without evidence or proof, that the God and the devil and all supernatural is non-existent. 
So to an atheist, to a, a, a modern philosopher, the idea that there is any such thing as a supernatural devil is as abhorrent as the idea that there is anything such as a god or angels or anything outside of their investigation. However, they spend an awful lot of time and energy um, delving into the skies and the, and the cosmos, looking for aliens, looking for some other form of life, looking for some power, some signal, something from outside that may or may not exist with no evidence that it does exist. We're told in um, Psalm 96 that the God of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And this is what we, we attest to, that, that the dreamers of the world are ignoring the fact that the Bible has been left on record for us, and it, it is the word of God. And it is a, a plausible hypothesis that you can look into and see what, how the world came into being and how the universe and why the universe exists. Now, of course, in, in our discussions, we're unlikely to please everyone. Um, so what we're attempting to do here is just to present the Bible and some of the evidence therein so listeners and people with open hearts and minds will personally arrive at an understanding of who, what and where Bible reality actually stands. Now, the devil. We mentioned earlier that the devil occurs in the Bible. So the, the, the simple word actually only occurs in the New Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, however, if you look at the word devils in the plural, you'll find it occurs a few times. Um, two times or there's two different words that are used in the Hebrew to mean devil in the King James Version. Um, and both words are patiently related to either false and or sacrificial worship. We have this word here, which is... Um, categorizes Strong's number 7700, and it is the word um, shad, S-H-E with a hat over it, D. Um, and, and it's just translated as a demon, whatever that means. Um, it says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, they sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. In this reference here, we're, we're, we're said that the people of Israel, when they provoked God to jealousy by adopting pagan worship and they forgot the one who is who is called the rock the rock who begot you um, if we have a look at psalm 106 it actually says a very similar thing they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of canaan and the land was polluted with blood so this word demons is, is translated as devils, and we can see it, it is obviously related to pagan worship and idol worship. The other Hebrew word which is translated as devils is this word um, sair, and there's associated words along with that as well. Um, and the thing, the thing is, this word means a goat. So it's interesting, it means hairy, he buck, goat, sacrificial animal, and it says there may, may refer to a demon-possessed um, goat like the swine at Gadara. If we know the New Testament, we'll know that there was an instance where Jesus um, told Legion to you know, have his, his um, afflictions depart and go into some goats, and they ran into the sea and were drowned. Um, so this word, this, this idea of a, um, of a demon or a goat is kind of like interesting. But it's also interesting that the, the word um, is, is made, used in reference to false worship, which was established by established by King Jeroboam in the northern kingdom of, of Israel in the, the middle um, northern kingdom period or the early northern kingdom period. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is we can also look and, and say with reference to the idea of sacrificing to idols or demons as maybe referred in some um, re translations. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he actually brings up this sort of idea with, with talking about false worship and true worship. And he says, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to, to demons. And this is actually, in his world, a Greek word, um, daimonion, and not to God. He says, I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. He's not, in, in confirming that this word exists, he's not actually confirming that these things are actually any powerful beings, which if you just go at one verse early, we would, we would have seen that. But it's too much to deal with. Um, but he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. So it's kind of the idea that these, these idols, these things are associated with mythology and pagan worship as opposed to being a real force in a rational world.
There's also many times where the word for goat is used for a goat. Um, there's all the occurrences where it's you know, a goat, there's a goat. It's normally to do with um, the offerings um, under the law of Moses in, in Leviticus. And, um, and we, we see there that it's, it's basically a sacrificial word or a sacred word relating to the, the, the sacrifice of the thing on the altar. And as, as I say, the same word is used for certain um, pagan practices as well. And we can always find lots of shaggy goats and there's different shaggy goats all over the place. Um, if we look at the New Testament, the word devils um, is recorded in many places in the plural, and it also is related to the shaggy goat. Well, although it's not, but it's, it's used in the same way as the demon, the idea of daimonion from the, from the Greek. There we go, demons, daimonion. Greek word 1140. Um, it is a divine power, or it's said to be a divine power, the spirit being inferior to God, evil spirits or ministers of the, of the devil. Um, Thea says, We posit this by definition in biblical. Oh, so I posit, this is an addition I added to Thea's definition, that this definition in biblical dictionaries is an, in error and is influenced by mythology more than reality. Um, that, that little line there is, sorry, I entered something and forgot to edit it out. Now, if you go and look at a dictionary and see what a demon is, here's the demon from the Britannica. Um, it says also spelt such way, classical Greek, such way. In Greek religion, it says it's a supernatural power. In Homer, so now we're getting into ancient Greek. In Homer, the term is used almost interchangeably with theos for a god of the pantheon. The distinction there is that Theos emphasizes the personality of the god and demon his activity. Hence, in turn, demon was regularly applied to sudden or unexpected supernatural interventions, not due to any particular deity. It became commonly the power determining a person's fate, and a mortal could have a personal demon, according to Greek mythology. So we're looking at these things and saying, well, this is an interesting, interesting thing which has been brought across from Greco-Roman mythology into um, Christianity. Now, many of the many of the things attributed to demons, which may or may not um, be in the in the record, attributed to as a miracle. Um, Jesus is said to have healed all manner of demons, all manner of illnesses, and we, we look at these things as things that you either give um, antibiotics, psych psychiatric medicine, um, or or some other. Um, medicinal preparation to cure in this day and age. Sometimes we might use joint replacements or, you know, put some artificial hearing on people. So things that are attributed to demons um, may, not, may not directly be said to have been miraculous out outworkings by God or other things in the, in the, the world that Jesus lived in. Um, in the New Testament, the few times that the word devil itself occurs, and we can look at the word devil, which is um, diabolos on the screen already, diabolos, which is um, Greek 1228. This word is a common word. It actually has a meaning in common parlance, and it means to accuse falsely or to traduce um, a false accuser or a slanderer. And there are a few times in the Bible where if the translators had translated this devil, they would have been either laughed out of court or um, they probably would have had a very difficult home life. Um, so they translated this either in different versions, either trans, um, slander, false accuser or um, malicious, malicious gossip. Here's, a, here's a, seg a segment of these. In um, 1 Timothy 3 verse 11, it says, Likewise, the wives must be reverent, not slanderers. Um, and then, if I've got a New King James there, that's New King, oh, that's New King James Version. Um, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 3, um, the New American Standard Version says, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good. Um, what have we got? Titus 3, 2, verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior. Not malicious gossips. Seems like the New American Standard just loves this malicious gossip word. I thought it was really good. Um, so the word, the word devil can now be translated as malicious gossip. And, and the, the meaning changes totally from what one might think when, when re reading um, um, Milton. Now in the English, because you've got to look at English words too. English words are strange. So it comes from the old English words, um, dürfel, 
related to the Dutch Duivel and the German Teufel. Now, somehow these words come from Latin via Greek diabolos. So somehow Latin and Greek turned into Teufel in German and Diofel in Dutch and it ended up as devil in English. And there's, there's um, in- interesting how language changes and modifies over the centuries. Um, and the definition here is accuser, slanderer, used in the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word uh, Satan um, from um, diabellium to slander and bolus to throw, so to, to basically go against somebody in, in some way or other. So we've got here slander, a false accuser, malicious gossip, um, non-specific entities, though if much of the occurrence of the word devil were translated as such, as I said, surely the mystique would evaporate. Um, so the question is, is the devil stated in the Bible to be immortal or spiritual in origin? Um, Let's open it out a little bit. Now, Jesus got into this discussion with the Pharisees, and um, Brother Wayne got into discussion with this this morning. Um, the religious elders of his time, Pharisees and Sadducees, rulers of the, of the, um, the, the temple in Jerusalem, um, and we've got to realise that Jesus was not above using um, common mythology, um, literary constructs, metaphors, simile, parables, examples, illustrations from life. Um, and he generally comes across as being reasonably well-read and also quite sardonic and maybe even sarcastic sometimes to those who would oppose him to their own detriment. The Pharisees, they came unto him in, in John chapter 8, and I've got verse 39 in front of me. It says here, um, Abraham is our father, and Jesus said, If you are Abraham's children, you will do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Okay, he's, he's stating it. Um, he's saying he heard the truth from God. And they go, but which way did God go from me to you, as, as the prophet in the Old Testament might have said? Um, he said, to him, if you are Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Um, Abraham did not do what you're trying to do. He says, you do the deeds of your father. Or they said, oh, and then they said to him, hey, we are not born of fornication. They accused him of not having a apparent father. <clears throat> um, and then Jesus said, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Then it goes on, Why don't you understand my speech? Here we go. It's like, am I speaking Greek to you? Um, because you're not able to listen to my words, so just sit there and listen for a bit. Um, if you were of, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, way to translate it, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. So it states here that they are of their father, the devil, um, and they do what the, the devil wanted to do from the very beginning, which is interesting. And they obviously knew what he was talking about. They were well read. They'd read you know, the writings of the fathers, the Torah, the Talmud. They'd read probably a lot of Greek as well. Um, so in this passage, we have debates about sonship, heritage, intent, and true religion. Now, so the liar is stated to be the father of the religious elders. Okay. Um, now, John the Baptist, he called people names too. Um, I haven't got a quote here, but we'll go black for a second. John the Baptist called people names. He wasn't above, you know, a little bit of um, satirical slander, if you like. And he said to the... Pharisees and Sadducees in Matthew 3 verse 7 when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into baptism he said O brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come so now John the Baptist is calling their father a snake a viper Jesus too he, did, he got this into this as well um, in Matthew chapter 12 verse 33 we could look up and it says um, in verse 34 actually O brood of vipers how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And it talks about how um, good, good things come out of a good heart and evil things come out of an evil heart. Now, from the very beginning, the serpent in Eden, the liar from the foundation of the world, the one who spread malicious gossip, the one who used intellect without knowledge to inform Eve of things it did not understand, it told a lie. It told a lie which caused death to fall upon all mankind the death of those disobedient to the laws of God. We're told by one man, one man's sin, death reigned. Um, Romans 
5 verse 12. Therefore, as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. It doesn't say really because of one serpent. All have sinned because of one, one serpent death spread through all men. But the actions of Adam and Eve to whom God gave a command that they should or should not eat of the fruit of a tree. The conclusion in Romans in verse 14 is, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness, stating that between Adam and Moses there was no law. There was no law given to anybody. But they still died. They still lived and died because of, as a consequence of Adam's sin, even though there was no transgression of law. Um, and then it goes, Had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come pointing forward to someone who would come who would be a greater than Adam who would actually have a test again and, and overcome a trial in his life. We could read now in Genesis, it actually tells us, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So the serpent is said to be cunning and, and said to have been made by the Lord God rather than being an immortal being that had lived forever and ever and somehow ended up in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said to the woman, you may eat of the fruit, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the garden. Um, so the woman said, you may eat. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Okay, so God said you will die. The serpent said you wouldn't die. The serpent lied. It didn't have this fact. It, it tried to reason it out, but it didn't have enough information. And it told the lie. And because of this lie, the woman believed the serpent. Well, maybe the, the the fruit looked better to eat than the consequence, which she didn't comprehend. And it says in Genesis 3, verse 7, And after they took the, took the tree and ate of it, Adam and Eve, the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they, for some reason, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So there we've got the fabric industry starting up in the Garden of Eden. So the serpent since then has been synonymous with the things in the Bible which are natural, fleshly, devilish, reasonings, devoid of God's ways and true religion. Now, only the serpent is blamed for telling the lie. There is no supernatural devil even mentioned or in, in, in included in that person. So the question we still have is, where is the immortal personal devil in the Bible? Now, in the Bible, there are stories of axes floating, people being raised to life, bears doing the judgment of God, asses talking, and cunning serpents. Now, all these may be attributed to special use of supernatural powers directly from God. Now, but these, these things are definitely not attributed to a supernatural power equal in power and potential to God himself, i.e. a supernatural devil. So none of the amazing miraculous occurrences need or have any connection with, in the instance in which they're recorded, to any supernatural devil. So... Despite adaptations in popular mythology and dogma, we, we, still, we still come to the query. Because God declares himself in the Bible, God declares himself as, Thus saith the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none else. <clears throat> It goes on in verse 21 of Isaiah 45. Um, Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared from ancient times? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a saviour. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you the ends of the earth. I am God and there is none other. So God declares himself as the only omnipotent, real being who, who can provide any form of hope and salvation for the living world. Even in the Christian world, where, where the claim of monotheism often exists, if we look across the Christian world, everyone claims to be, have one God and be monotheistic. But, but the sects of Christendom have obviously redefined, and, and in various different ways, mono to mean try. Try unity, one in three, three in one, in a, an imponderable um, mess of undecipherable creeds, which they need to qualify their unbiblical positions. So then, on the other side, in the in the um, 
in the developing world and in the, in the development of the Christian world when the bulk of people were pagan, if they had progressed across the world and tried to become their, the political machine that Christianity became, if they were to obliviate the pantheon from the Greco-Roman times, they would have been devastated in their fields of endeavour. So the pantheonic daimonians were adopted as saints by the church, demigods for the praise and adoration to replace all the functions of the Greek, Roman and other systems, multiplexity of gods for every event, day, emotion, thing and place. But there was one that couldn't be eradicated. Actually, there wasn't one. There's one class that couldn't be eradicated because the Greeks and Romans didn't have a single god for that which is evil. They had many. Half their gods were evil gods because it's like you had good and evil on, on all days of the week. You had to have one for a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on. But there was one that couldn't be ignored by the demonic worship adherents of evil, and that, that is the one who became synonymous with mankind himself, the devil, the false accuser, the one who would be stated to cause all ill and all evil, the one who was the multitudinous evil in the ancient world, is rolled into one in Christianity. <clears throat> now, it's interesting. There's, there's, um, there's poetry around. There's lots of, many lines have been written. I, I'm not a big poet, but um, John Milton in A Paradise Lost, he wrote about 10,000 lines of, um, of poetry. It's 12 volumes. If you, if you choose to read it, it's quite long. Um, it really is, I'll call it a parabiblical epic. Now, in the allusions, and he makes reference not only to the devil, um, but everything which could be attributed to a supernatural denier of God's right to rule. Um, he, he basically has put a lot of the strange, perfused dogma from the Greco-Roman world and the Catholic space into a form which people can, well, can be added into plays and movies and, <clears throat> and people can access it. And it's actually entered into, into um, modern English as a, a work of art. Now, we can, read, we can read these things and we can hear things from the Bible in amongst the poetry, like I could um, pick, a, pick a section here. I've got like 12 books. It's like a lot of it. Um, here we go. Let's start. It says, to ask, to ask nor let thine own inventions hope, things not revealed, which the invisible king only omniscient hath suppressed in night, to none communicable in earth or heaven. Enough is left besides to search and know. But knowledge is as food and needs no less her temperance over appetite to know. In measure what the mind might well contain, oppresses else with surfeit and soon turns wisdom to folly as nourishment to wind. Know then that after Lucifer from heaven, so called him brighter once amid the host of angels than that star the stars among, fell with his flaming legions through the deep into his place, and the great sun returned, victorious with his saints, the omnipotent eternal father, from his throne beheld their multitude, and to his son thus spake, At least our envious foe hath failed, who thought, all like himself rebellious, by whose aid this inaccessible high strength, the seat of deity supreme, us dispossessed, he trusted to have seized and into fraud, drew many whom their place knows here no more. It's wonderful. Did you pick anything out of that which comes from a biblical construct or a biblical turn of phrase? Did you notice Lucifer, the, the, morning, the, once, the once brighter than once amongst the stars? It's just interesting how what he's done, he's taken a few little paraphrases or phrases out of the Bible and turned them into a continuous flow, which actually has a lot of biblical input into it. And it sounds biblical, and it's like a lot of, a lot of things which sound biblical, but in, other, but in actual fact, they are not. In another place, he says, Then suffered the other way, Satan went down, um, the causey to hell gate on either side, disparted chaos, overbuilt, exclaimed, and with rebounding surge the bars assailed that scorned his indignation through the gates, wide open and unguarded, Satan passed and all about found desolate for those appointed to sit there had left their charge. Flown to the upper world, the rest were all far to the inland retired without, about the walls of pandemonium, city and proud seat of Lucifer, so by illusion called of that bright star to Satan paragoned. There kept their watch the legions while the grand in council sat, salacious what chance might intercept their emperor sent. Strange, isn't it? 
these words have actually been drawn out of, out of some biblical, biblical quotes and actually turned into, turned into um, you know, things which people actually think are fact. If we were to look, turn to the Bible and see where these come from, we would actually turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And it says here in the beginning of Isaiah chapter 14, which is um, the literature just snippets, snippets out a very small section and turns it into wonderful, wonderful um, poetry. It says, It shall come to pass in a day that Yahweh gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear, that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How has the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? Now, what's this got to do with anything? It's strange. Um, if we run down and we, we'll look down at um, verse 11 and 12, it says, Your pomp is brought down to Sheol. And it's obviously talking about the king of Babylon in this instance. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol and the sound of your stringed instruments. The, mag the maggot is spread under you and worms cover you. Now, turns a phrase, interesting poetry, a little bit like Milton. It's actually not necessarily a literal thing that you can say, hey, this is actually a thing, but it actually means something more than the words themselves. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And Milton actually took a lot of these, um, these passages on board when he wrote those, those passages. If you go back through and read it, it's actually amazing how much has been included. But it's like as if this is actually a reality and what, what it's talking about, the heaven there, is actually literal heaven where God seats as opposed to a parable about a king who lives in exalted places in, in the nations and he's going to be cast down to the ground and even put underground eventually um, when he meets his end. Now the word, um, the word Lucifer there, which often everyone just hears Lucifer and says, well often, obviously that means the devil because of Milton. Um, it's the Hebrew word um, halal, which means brightness, or the morning star. It's used for, for Venus, or the, the, the last star appearing in the, in the sky in the morning, or the first star in the evening, in, in many cases. Um, it goes through the Latin to come to us as, um, for the Latin, lux. Lux is light, and fur means bearing, so it's called the light bearer, because it's that first evening star the, the, that lights up the sky as soon as the sun sets. So in the text of Isaiah, it's um, explicitly referring to a, a human, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Um, and it's obviously a prophecy which is made by the God of heaven through his supernatural ability to foretell the future. Sent to his servants, the prophets, those men who actually recorded the things that God wanted to record. Take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? So we see here the truth in the Bible... Um, presents the, the concept of devil as not being any supernatural anything or not being anything more than being a personification of human nature in personal, national and corporate manifestations. It's said to be a slanderer, a liar, a false accuser or if you take the Hebrew word Satan it is the adversary, the enemy, the one who is against everything that is right and true and that God stands for. It's a malicious gossip, the antithesis to God's truth. <clears throat> Many times in, in the New Testament especially, the word devil is used in, in um, reference to political entities um, who, who are definitely in violent opposition to truth, violent opposition to true believers, violent opposition to the declared purpose of God. In the instance of the temptation of Jesus, which we read earlier, um, the actual devil in function is clear. The function of the devil is as the serpent in Eden. It is there to present to the ideal man that question, that impetus to question what is right. He may have had a natural inclination to go along with whatever he'd heard. So the, the, the false accuser, the traducer, the one who was to put the, the kernel of doubt in the mind of Jesus, to seek to inflame his lusts, to taunt him to the edge of submission... In James, we, we learn a little bit about these topics. Um, in James, it says in verse t chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised those who love him. 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. So it must be the devil. Um, not God. Okay. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But James corrects my initial thought, which everybody would naturally think. But everyone is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. Or in the King James Version, his own lust and enticed. I've used different versions because it sort of helps those who live in the modern world. And then when desire has conceived, it brings forth or gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The main thing is, are we deceived? Have we been deceived? Has the world been deceived? Have, has the, the deceitful heart overtaken everything? In, in Jeremiah 17 verse 9 it says, The heart, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There's nothing the human heart um, without restraint will not do or act upon. There's nothing that needs any external, supernatural, personal being to tempt and taunt us as fallen man towards the heart the ego the desire of humanity that's all that's necessary and this is actually biblical truth the serpent in the garden of eden that first liar he was condemned to crawl on his belly and he was said dust would be his meat the man and woman were blamed for their own disobedience and condemned to die along with all of their descendants <clears throat> In Genesis 3, verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and you will eat dust all the days of your life. He was truly to become legless. In verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In the, in the quote in verse 15, there is actually a hidden... A hidden gem, a hidden hope there. The hidden hope is that at some point a descendant of the woman would um, have his foot bitten in parable and in response he would kick back and bruise the head of the serpent. Now we read about how the whole thing came out over in the New Testament. In Romans 5 verse 17 we read that as through one man's, one man's offence, judgment came on all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteousness, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. <clears throat> in Hebrews, we see Jesus in his, in his state perfected. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. States say that Jesus' role was to come and to liberate humanity by destroying the one that had the power of death, i.e. the devil. So Jesus, in his act of living a sinless life and dying on the cross, the fact that he was raised from the death means he had already killed the devil. The devil is dead. If the devil were supernatural or immortal, the devil would not be able to die. So it behoved him to be made like unto his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. In that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Jesus was tempted and he survived. The devil departed from him initially when he was in the wilderness, but he put the devil to death permanently when he died. The apostles from Peter to Paul declared to the world that Jesus lives. <clears throat> they also declared that, well, we also know, we can see that Jesus trod on the serpent's head and dealt that mortal wound to the devil. The, the one who is the metaphorical, personalized, the personified tempter, he died at the cross of Jesus. So Jesus came and declared the Father's love to the world and he now calls upon all men everywhere to follow him. There are those who would give up all to follow the master. 
Jesus had his disciples who came to him and, and said to him, Grant us that we might sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand in your kingdom of glory. But Jesus said to them, You know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We can. Jesus said to them and to many followers who would come after, um, You indeed will drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it will be given to them for whom it is prepared. In another place it says, To whom it is prepared of my Father. So for those of all ages, the message has gone out, and Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who believes not shall be damned. Biblical evidence. Jesus put the devil to death. The devil is not immortal, eternal, personal, nor all-powerful. God is Lord, is Lord alone. He is the creator and master of the destiny of the universe. We have all been called to take up the cross of Jesus to repent, to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And we hope that this short lecture has highlighted at least a further aspect of the walk towards God's kingdom for all of us and you in the audience. Thank you.